The theme of the message is a day of great joy, and it's taken from the Gospel of Luke. So let's read together as we prepare to look into this passage of Scripture. At the close of the sermon, we'll have communion together, and then we'll experience the joy of greeting one another and going our separate ways. But let's begin by reading Scripture together. Would you all stand to your feet? We're going to be reading from Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. Very, very familiar passage of Scripture. Let's read together out loud. We just saw those shepherds singing, and, uh, and so we know a little bit more about them. Let's, let's read together. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger, Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. Let's pray. Father, we accept the message. We desire to be the ones that you are pleased with, and we desire that you would bring joy and peace into our lives. Help us to understand this passage of Scripture today. And then apply the passage to our very lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats again. I I reposted a little while ago, I reposted on my timeline a really nice quote that I had from Pastor Oyan from a few years ago, in which he talked about the, the story of Jesus and it being based in history. One of the things that's very interesting to me as I meet people who have been predominantly educated in the West is that many of them have listened to and heard a lot of really strange ideas. A few years ago, there was a young man that was, uh, was here from Holland, and he was g- gathering in one of our gatherings that we were having, and we were talking about Jesus, and, and he just simply said, well, you know, I'm, ed- I'm university educated, and in university, everybody knows that Jesus may never have existed, was not a historical figure. Folks, that's absurd. You can argue whether he was the son of God or not, but historically to argue that he never existed, it just makes no sense at all. It is one of the most well-attested facts of history that Jesus existed, that he was a Palestinian Jew, that he was under the Romans, that he was, that he was executed by the Romans, and that his followers sprung up after that event. You cannot deny it. And the thing that's important for us to understand is that the framework that we have, the story that we read, tells us things about Jesus and tells us things that should impact our lives. Now, I want to say here, and you're going to, you know, I know some of you who know me are starting to cringe a little bit because you can feel a history lesson coming on, okay? So those of you who don't like history, just close your ears for a few minutes. But I want to say here that public speaking in our modern day and age is a little bit riskier than it perhaps has been in the past because many times people are are recording what you say and we've all seen uh, people in in different spheres in in, uh, show business and politics and others who have said things that they thought nobody was ever going to hear and then when they were repeated it had severe impacts for them. I, I'm a U.S. citizen, and I've lived most of my, self, uh, my, my life outside of the U.S., and I've always tried to be very, very careful to respect the countries in which I live. Uh, I try not to get involved in the politics of the country. I try not to have an opinion, and because you know me, if I have an opinion, I'm, I usually express it. I try not to have an opinion, and I do everything I can not to express it, but I'm always aware and conscious of the fact that You can do something or you can see something or you can hear something and not understand the underlying political uh, impact. Let me try and give you an example. In 1985, I lived in Manila. 
I was involved with an, with an attempt to plant 10 churches in the city of Manila during the year 1985. And one of the things that we had was uh, we had a group of 175 teenagers from the United States who were coming to Manila and we were working together with them in one part of the city in Cubao and they were going to go all over and invite people to come to revival meetings that we were holding seven nights in a row right in the middle of the city where all the buses changed and, and everything else like that in, in Cubao and Metro Manila. Now, in 1985, there was a pressing political issue in the Philippines. Uh, at that time, if you remember, though I guess a lot of you aren't even old enough to remember, uh, uh, Benin Aquino had come back to the Philippines and had been assassinated. And there was a political uh, contest, an election that was going to be held between the president and his, uh, his widow. And one of the things that had happened as he had been preparing to come back to the country, a song had uh, tied into his return, and that was a song that I hope you've never had to sing, but it goes uh, something like this. Tie a yellow ribbon round an old oak tree. You remember that song? It's based on an old story, and then uh, Tony Orlando wrote a little song about it and made a lot of money. And by adopting it, they adopted the supporters of Mr. Aquino, adopted yellow ribbons as, his, as their color. And then as he was assassinated and then they went through all of this process, the tying of a yellow ribbon became a very, very strong political act. If you were supporting the president, you didn't have yellow on and you, 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 you didn't certainly wear yellow ribbons. And then if you were supporting the, uh, the Mrs. Aquino, then you wore yellow outfits. You always wore yellow outfits. You put yellow ribbons all over your fence. You put yellow ribbons all over everything, okay? Political context. 175 teenagers are coming from the United States and I'm going to the Manila airport to pick them up. And when I get there, there's a real problem. You know why? Some smart guy in the United States says, hey, we need to find a way to make sure that we mark all of our bags so we can all find the bags that belong to our children. You know where this is going? Let's buy some yellow ribbon, and we cut yellow ribbon into pieces, and every single one of those kids, 175 suitcases, plus all the equipment, plus all everything, hundreds of pieces were coming off of the planes because they came in two batches, all wrapped up in ribbons. And the immigration people and the customs people wanted to know, who are these foreigners who are so boldly making a political statement in our country? And all the teenagers said, where's my bag? <laughs> now, we, we recognize that, I recognize that when I say things in any country where I visit, and especially this place, which is my home, I want to do absolutely anything I can, everything I can to respect the country and respect the laws of the country. And so I try and be very conscious of that. And if I ever overstep the role of a guest, please forgive me because I love being here and I'm very honored that this country allows me to be here. But what this simply means is that there can be implications of things that because of our background, we don't even understand, right? So... The kids didn't know what yellow ribbons meant. And depending on where you are, you might not understand some of the things that are going on. Like in, in, my, in my home country, during a political season, people talk about donkeys and elephants. What, what is that? And yet everybody knows what it is. We're going to look at a passage just before the one we read to try and understand the political context of what's going on that Luke is saying and to recognize that there's some things in there that we may not have really paid attention to. So just before that passage we read in verses 8 all the way through 14, I want to read you what it says, starting in verse 1 in Luke chapter 2. At that time, the Roman emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Assyria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. Now, when we read that, we understand the details and we try and figure them out. And the kids make you know, costumes and do shows and all of these different things. 
But this paragraph that, that Luke wrote is a profoundly political statement. Not obviously to us, but it is profoundly political. It is true that this statement measures or places the, the birth of Jesus in history, but it places the birth of Jesus in history in a very, very clear and very, uh, I should even say in some senses, very risky way. Let me start off with the very beginning. At that time, the Roman emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. Right off the bat, Luke tells us this is about Augustus. Now, what do we know about Augustus? What do we know? Caesar Augustus was the adopted son of Julius Caesar. When Julius Caesar was assassinated, there was a, a war that was fought over many forces over who would take his place as the leader of the republic. Caesar Augustus became the sole ruler of the entire Roman world after a very bloody civil war. He overpowered all of his rival claimants. His last enemy to be destroyed was a very famous Mark Antony. Mark Antony was the boyfriend of? Cleopatra. Mark Antony committed suicide after his forces were defeated in the Battle of Actium in 31 B.C. He went from being the adopted son of Caesar to being the new Caesar, the new king, and he took on the name Augustus. And he began to do a number of things. First of all, he turned the Roman Republic into an empire with himself at the head. He changed the rules. He became the head. He also proclaimed that he had brought justice and peace to the whole world. Now, we know that historically by the phrase Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. He was going to make sure there were no more small ro uh, wars going on all over the place. He brought justice and peace to the whole world. He declared his adopted father, Julius Caesar, to have been a god. Now, think about it for a minute. If your father is a god, then you are the son of God. Ooh, is that, is, that, is that familiar language to us? Poets wrote songs about this new era that had begun. These songs were sung by choirs who would sing when Augustus would go to different places. He had, would have choirs that would sing of his greatness and his grandeur and how everything was going to be told. The historians wrote these long histories about how Rome was getting greater and greater, and its climax was when Augustus himself became the Savior and the Lord of the entire world. Now, we all know that there was a whole bunch of world that wasn't included in all of this. Okay, but we're speaking of what they knew and understand. He was its king. He was its lord. And increasingly, in the eastern part of the empire, People worshipped him as a God and as a son of God. What do we see happening here? What's going on? And uh, Tom Wright says of it this way, the birth of this little boy is the beginning of a confrontation between the kingdom of God in all of its apparent weakness, insignificance, and vulnerability and the kingdoms of this world. The lesson that Luke is trying to teach to us here is simply this. Jesus is the real Savior. Jesus is the real King of Kings. Jesus is the real Lord. Jesus is the person who's bringing real peace. Don't, don't miss this. I'm surprised that Luke could get away with it. Luke took the language of, of all these proclamations, looked to the language of, of calling Augustus the Son of God, the Savior of the world, uh, uh, the, the bringer of peace, and all of these things, and he took all of this and he applied it to who? Jesus. Is, is, there, is there a little imbalance between that occasion there? Son of Caesar... Son of Mary, in Rome, great victory, in Palestine, occupied territory. Let's take a look at this. The message that's being communicated through this passage that would have been understood by everyone who reads it and should be understood by you and I is that Jesus is the real Savior who brings real peace. How is this communicated in this story? This is the part we read. First of all, the angels show up. 
The angels show up to a bunch of shepherds out in the field. Now, it's important to note, and I mentioned it earlier, wherever the emperor went for a special event, Caesar Augustus would show up and there would be a choir singing for him. In Luke's story, there's a choir. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying there wasn't a choir. I believe there was an angel choir. But Luke has a very specific reason to pick that particular aspect to tell us. God sent a choir of angels to those shepherds, and they sang. And it's important to understand that that's a statement from God, and it's a statement from Luke. Jesus had an angel choir. I don't care how good those choirs were. The angel choir was even better. Now, what else is about this angel showing up thing? If you've been following the story and reading along, and if you remember from last year, angels are showing up a lot. But up till now, they'd showed up in one particular way. Zechariah saw an angel. Elizabeth saw an angel. Mary saw an angel. Joseph saw an angel. And what happened? Same, same line almost every time. Don't be afraid. And then they tell them what they're supposed to do. All of a sudden, only limited people who are already a part of this particular story, they're the only ones that get to see an angel. And then all of a sudden, just out of nowhere, this crowd of shepherds on a hillside, all of these angels appear to them. They hear the angels singing. And now this message is shared for everybody. Not just the insiders, but the outsiders as well. You see, the shepherds in this story represent the rest of us. They represent you and I. It's when this story expands and brings us in. In verses 9 and 10 that we read together, it says, Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all you shepherds. No. The great joy is for all people. Who is this, this child? The angels tell the shepherds, again, not the kings, not the governor, not all those people around. They tell the shepherds who this child is. He is their savior. One of the titles that was given to Caesar Augustus. But what we understand that they, about Jesus is that he would not save them from the impact of terrible things in the world. He would save them and he would save us from our sins. He is the Messiah. He was not anointed by the Senate. He did not get his power by overcoming his enemies. He did not win it through battles and, and, and getting the right allies at the right time. He was the Messiah. He was anointed and sent by God. And he is the true Lord. The word that speaks of the authority that he has. In other words, what is being communicated to these shepherds and through these shepherds uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as Luke tells this story, having researched it carefully like the historian that he is, is that Jesus is the real deal. This is the real thing. Augustus is the counterfeit of a savior. He, Augustus is, is the culmination of power and authority and everything else of mankind. And Jesus is the one that God really sent. You see, this is good news for all of God's people and a great day of great joy. Now, what does this mean to you and I today? First of all, you and I need to learn to resist the temptation to think that any way other than God's way is a good way or a way that will bring us joy in life. Just like there was all the Roman strength and power and authority and everything else like that, there was another way, and it's the way of Jesus. It's the way of, 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 of suffering. It's the way of discipleship. It's the way of forgiveness. It's the way of caring. And we must always resist the temptation to think, no, let's just apply a little bit of this worldly way, and then we'll, we'll, we'll follow God's way. One of the things that we find interesting here is that I mentioned to you the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, because the Roman legions marched all over that part of the world and set the world in order so that commerce spread, people spread, things went well, enforced by Roman law. And as powerful as that was and as significant historically it was, it didn't last. Eventually, it crumbled. The decision or the issue here for you and I is to ask ourselves this question. Where do we put our faith? Do we put our faith in God's way? Or do we put our faith in the way of the world? Do we put our faith in the way of Jesus? Do we put our faith in forgiveness, in righteousness, and love, and gentleness? 
or do we put it in the way of the world? On the time that Jesus was born, to call him Lord, to call him Savior, to call him Messiah was ridiculous. He was the apparently, the, uh, the child, a poor child, born out of wedlock, or at least conceived out of wedlock, who lived in a very poor place, and his parents, although from a, a tribe that had some honor, they were nobody significant at all. His, his father, earthly father, Joseph, was so insignificant that we don't even know when he died or anything else like that. And you take this child and you compare him to Caesar Augustus. And this is the issue for all of us. Where do we put our faith? Where do we put our hope? Do we put our hope and faith in the things of this world, the might of this world, the power of this world, or do we surrender ourselves to Jesus? Where we find true rejoicing, we find true peace, we find true forgiveness, and we find everlasting peace in our hearts.